Well, well, you know, I think I'm going to take a minute or two, if I could, Chris, and before I introduce you and, and make fun of you, because that's what I've been looking forward to all week, I must say. I'm sure. Um, you know, that, that's, my, that's my compensation for this opportunity. But I do want to just uh, echo something that was said earlier about the great job that the team has done here. I want to thank uh, you know, Dr. Dave Nickel for the hospitality and for all the work that he, he and his team have done here as well as the entire um, planning group that uh, a rather robust team, I won't mention them because I know I'll miss somebody, but a special thanks to uh, Andrea and to you know, Katie and obviously to uh, that guy behind the camera, Mike Miller, who uh, kept us going and pretty impressive to be able to uh, herd this many cats through uh, a five day period over uh, multiple uh, sessions. So that's really, really impressive and I, I am, um, want to thank everybody for the opportunity and for the great work that's being done. So with that, I will um, I will go ahead and introduce uh, this last panel as far as the moderator, none other than Chris Doan. Uh, Chris Doan has, you know, I, he's got an impressive bio. I won't read all of that. He currently uh, uh, serves as a senior uh, strategic planner and the uh, Assistant Division Chief for Resources at the Coast Guard's Atlantic area. And, you know, I, I've known Chris for years. We actually were colleagues about uh, a dozen years ago. And one of the highlights of that, that tour when I was the Chief of Staff for Atlantic area is I got to uh, work on a regular basis uh, with uh, not only Chris Stone, but his, uh, what I'll call his foil, uh, Joe Dorenzo. And, and to see the two of those guys uh, go at it and talk about things way, you know, they're both way smarter than uh, they need to be, which is kind of annoying for a guy like me. So, uh, but I, I would listen to them and just try to pick up nuggets. But, uh, you know, I, I just appreciate there's probably nobody better to do a wrap up panel uh, and with this distinguished group of people that are in this panel than Chris Stone, who has done just remarkable work. And I want to publicly thank you, Chris, for your almost four decades of service to your country. Uh, so with that, Chris, I will turn it over to you with my thanks uh, for what you're doing. And uh, thank you to the rest of the entire uh, group for the great uh, great Maritime Risk Symposium 2020. It will certainly be one that is uh, memorable in many ways. All right, super. Thank you for the very kind words. It's great to see you. Uh, it's, it's been a while, so uh, good to see your face again. Too bad this couldn't have been in person. I would have enjoyed uh, some interaction with you. But again, thank you for the kind words, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our final panel. I hope everyone's enjoyed the symposium as much as I have, as unique as it's been. Uh, it's certainly provided a lot of uh, information, and I think a lot of uh, thought-provoking discussion uh, as the panel's gone through. So my congratulations and, and thanks to all the uh, chairs for, for the hard work that they put in. Uh, first, just volunteering to be the chair and then the work of putting together their panels and, and providing such uh, a great event for all of us. So this afternoon, uh, we're going to give our, our chairs a, an opportunity to um, summarize and, and pick, pick out some of the highlights from their from their own panels and uh, join in a discussion as we, uh, we wrap this up. Uh, just to reintroduce our, our panel. Uh, panelists uh, and our chairs, uh, Captain Todd Bonner from the Canadian Navy, uh, Captain uh, David Moskoff from the uh, Merchant Marine Academy, Dr. John Maliski from Texas A&M. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Uh, Young uh, McClure has, has been able to join us yet from the uh, Coast Guard Academy. Uh, I haven't seen her come but hopefully she'll be able to join us shortly. Dr. Craig Phillip from Vanderbilt, Dr. Henry Willis from uh, the RAND Corporation, Dr. Kristen Lewis from the Volpe Center and Professor David Nickel, who uh, ran this entire symposium symposium for us so well. And I, I appreciate every one of you for the work, that, again, that you did through this uh, symposium and for your participation this afternoon. Uh, in closing out uh, this panel, I've, I've asked each of the uh, panelists to, to begin with uh, some opening comments. Uh, and in that, I've asked them to, to address uh, three questions. Uh, the first being, what uh, what were the most important takeaways from their own panel? Uh, then what were the uh, most important three to five takeaways from the entire symposium as they went through this? And then uh, what would they recommend for a significant research topic 
from the overall symposium conversation. And this, this third question is so important to me because as we continue to try to, to move forward and strengthen the maritime and address maritime risk, developing strong re uh, research questions and having those actually taken on and, uh, and solved uh, is key to what we're trying to do here. Uh, so uh, once we get through those opening comments, uh, we'll open up, we should have about 15 minutes or so for uh, for questions, and we'll we'll close up with uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 finish out this uh, this conference. So with that, let's start with our, our first panel chair, Captain Monaire, uh, who led the panel on resilience in the maritime infrastructure. So, Todd. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris, and uh, I would echo uh, a big congratulations to all the organizers. Um, we hold uh, several conferences. Uh, annually, and uh, I know the hard work that goes into it. So, well done to uh, Andrea and Dave and uh, Kate, and, and and the plethora of support people have made it possible. Um, I'll keep it really brief. Um, thankfully, my camera is not working. I actually just finished an appointment at the dentist, so I don't think um, I want to be publicly seen drooling uh, as the freezing is starting to wear off. So, hopefully, there's no impediments to what I'm saying, and everybody understands. Um, the three points that we took from um, from our panel, really, uh, I don't think these are, are earth shattering. They're just very um, simple observations. Um, we had uh, the first one was uh, really resilience has to happen in layers. It's not episodic. It's not singular, um, but it happens much like concentric circles rippling out uh, around that that needs to be protected. Uh, the second thing was uh, these concentric circles really require a thorough uh, stakeholder mapping and engagement. So understanding how uh, your engagement, your relationship with your stakeholders um, impacts them as you're building your resiliency and, and any weaknesses uh, that you might be inadvertently causing. And I think the third one was kind of very interesting. Uh, this one was from Dr. Uh, Robbie Bears. Um, presentation, and that's isolation is not always a negative uh, when we're talking about resilience. So he had a presentation about the Arctic, and and it uh, I, I kind of joked with him saying it was a Schrodinger's cat uh, of uh, resilience. I think overall from the other panels, um, I had a pretty busy work week, so I couldn't attend every single one, but I tried to capture. Uh, email people to get their slides so I could go through them. I think, again, uh, the takeaway was resilience really is a systems of systems, and it needs to have a systemic approach. Uh, and I think you have to understand how your actions or your organization's actions will impact others, and understanding the third, second, fourth order effects of decisions you make within that great model that was presented by our opening speaker of how to approach resilience. Uh, this next thing was to, uh, to really be aware of the benefits of nonlinear thinking. I think uh, many people think in terms of processes and they're very linear, but uh, I think it came out on, very, uh, on several slides, several, pre several presentations, that nonlinear thinking uh, is quite beneficial when we're talking about resilience. And the last one, um, this is, uh, I think, an altruism throughout any really uh, any organization, but trust and communication really are essential elements of any plan to, to build, to improve, or to initiate uh, actions to, uh, to have resilience. Um, I think that one's just a, a very simple um, statement. When I thought about the, uh, the research question, um, this one I thought was a little tough. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can uh, to delve into, but my background being uh, with the military, uh, being and associated with NATO, I think for us, the research that needs to follow up is how do you transcend the potential to be very nationalistic when you're building resilience in key infrastructure, and particularly for, for us, we're talking about European energy um, infrastructure. So that one, uh, I think, could have some more follow-up and would be beneficial. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris. All right. Thank you, Todd. Uh, appreciate the uh, the words and the thoughts. 
Uh, our second panel was uh, Captain Moskoff on uh, maritime resilience and human elements. So, uh, Captain, if you'll take it away. Thank you very much. So anyway, as far as my three panelists, I, I just wanted to give you some some uh, single takeaways from each one. I think the clear takeaway from Shell and Captain Scally was that uh, the humans are their critical element. Uh, we talked about the human element aspects and resilience, but but for Shell and so many of the uh, high-end energy companies, they really do value their people as their most critical elements. So I think Jim made that very clear, and uh, they tried to do the best they could to uh, minimize all the uh, close calls they have with uh, you know human beings on board and and the equipment. So. Second tech away from our MIT professor there uh, was that the autonomous uh, software that they've put together there over all these years is a tremendous base piece of software that's going out to uh, the military and the industry, and then they're customizing it to their needs, and, and that's quite a, um, a very uh, important function that MIT is uh is uh, generating there. So I, I really didn't know much about it till I, I uh, found Mike. And um, yeah, we've talked about it since, but they put a lot of uh, things out there for our military. And I, I believe that some of our, um, our friends, and uh, I think I won't go any further than that. So anyway, uh, John Jorgensen, Reliability and Resilience was the title of his slides. And uh, cyber uh, for him and um, for so much of what ABS does is really looking at active risk management. They, they really assess uh, how much risk you're willing to accept. And obviously, if you don't like a lot of risk, uh, according to uh, John, you can pretty much nail down a lot of it. It's just a matter of putting the effort and time and money into it. So it seemed clear to me that all three of them uh, really uh, did a great job on what they uh, were trying to do. So I'm going to move on to a couple other uh, aspects of um, the event and just start at the very beginning because Steve Flynn uh, made real clear, and he is a super expert in it, I've uh, been doing it a while, that uh, we need to prepare for, adapt, and rapidly recover for that uh, particular function we're looking at. Then a lot of the panelists, including my panel, uh, my panel was talking about human resilience. Uh, so different panels had different types of resilience, but basically very similar uh, at 30,000 feet. Uh, I thought Admiral Fossum's uh, uh, little keynote was uh, a really good um, overall leadership uh, function for the event because he made it clear that um, you know it was all about preparation and training and and knowing what they were doing and then planning it out, developing all the teamwork with uh, the folks they were going to be on board with, uh, getting it simulated out, and then trapping any errors that. That occurred. So, I have to say, um, between Steve's uh, keynote and then Admiral Fossum's uh, clear, clear um, little keynote on on really leadership and and how much it, uh, it it impacted all this. When you look at that uh, vehicle, that was some beast to get into orbit and and make sure that everything went well with it. I I think what he made clear to us was everything was manual. And there were, I think he said, like a thousand switches that you had to throw each one and in the right sequence. So I'm glad I didn't have to do that. So uh, I want to focus for just a minute or two on that first part of Steve's business about preparing for, because I think if we could uh, recognize the events that lie before us that we have to be resilient for, I think we could prepare for it if we wanted to. That's the question. Do do we really want to expend the energy and the time for it? And I'd like to show you a photo of us here in our full mission bridge simulator not too long ago, just as we started up this past summer. Uh, we, you know, this was my decision uh, that we not only had to wear gloves and masks, but we also were running face shields for us 
Um, a lot, you know, some of the instructors were a little nervous being on the bridge with the uh, with the students, uh, but you know, we all got through it, and uh, we were worried about us infecting them, then infecting us, but we all got through it. And uh, at the same time, we practiced what we always pa- practice, which is experiential learning, which was really what the shuttle missions were about, um, trying to gather what they could on each miss- mission and, and uh, try to simulate uh, what they expected to deal with and all the failures that would occur. And we try to do that on our bridge, but uh, probably not at the shuttle level. Um, I highly recommend one of the best ways we can deal with uh, the resilience of uh, different uh, problems that we think might occur, like if we lose our navigation systems or our cyber systems on board, or and this, this goes for any place, any time, just pull the plug on the system, see what happens, see what everybody does. Uh, obviously, you don't want to do this on a bridge in dense traffic. But uh, if the captain, the chief engineer, and the company's on board, I don't see why, if, they, if they're going along with it, I don't see why the captain just can't come up on the bridge and, and fail the system if they've got plenty of sea room, not much traffic, and see what the gang does with their navigation and collision avoidance and all that good stuff. So, black swan events. You know, are they mysteries? I don't know. I, was COVID a mystery? You know, it was to me, I, I didn't think it would happen. I heard from a lot of people that something of this magnitude would never happen. Um, maybe this guy knew, but I didn't know. Maybe other people knew. But, uh, you know, trying to adapt for it, as Steve Flynn would say, trying to adapt for the event, um, it didn't go too well on the on the first. Uh, you know, we had world experts telling us, uh, you know, don't wear a mask and it went on and on. So as far as black uh, swan events, um, I want to talk about these. And this is more for the uh, research portion that uh, we've been asked to pr- provide here. And sea level rise, I presented uh, real quick in a question. Uh, you would be surprised. It's on It's on YouTube. If you go to NOAA Air Gap, you can find... Um, bridge collision videos where bridges are running, uh, where ships uh, run their uh, masts in the bridges because they're, they're, they're planning on clearing by six inches somehow. So anyway, as sea level rises a foot, two feet, and maybe more, um, it'd be nice to find out how we're going to deal with this. And um, the Bayonne Bridge costs $1.7 billion in cash. Uh, but the, cl- the cost to the uh, surrounding community was quite quite large, so went and took a look at that. Uh, Captain Trent, Andrew, uh, David Trent, or Andrew Trent, put up a, uh, a chat question, which never got uh, the light of day there because we had so many questions because there's so much interest in the panels. But he asked about radio wave connectivity, which I had uh, scratched the surface on earlier with another question. And that's what it's all about right now. Uh, connectivity and satellites are are the way all vessels are communicating, and uh, it's a very vulnerable uh, type of um, situation. So until somebody figures out a way to ensure uh, connectivity like we have with fiber, sure, it's a problem. Uh, Joe knows I've been beating the drum, Dr. Joe Dorenzo and Chris and uh, Fred uh, uh, Fred um, at Rutgers, he's been unbelievable. Um, I, I can't say enough about a Rutgers support on this, too, because um, position navigation and timing is key to everything we do, land or shore. And the timing aspect is quite a bit more important than the position and navigation aspect. So if we got an alternate system in like Eloran, I'd really like to see research done on all three of these topics. And the fourth topic I put here, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, the Carrington storm of 1859 um, was uh, a beast of a solar storm, a coronal ejection. And we had one not too long ago, about eight years ago, that just missed us uh, by nine days or so. And if we have one of these ejections, a lot of scientists are saying it's going to burn up all the chips on every device on that side of the earth. So if one of these things happen, you know, 
That would be a true black swan of that. But we know it's coming. We just don't know when. So a lot of these four topics, Chris, are all yours. Uh, but I really would like to see uh, an alternate system for timing, because if that goes out, all the world's infrastructure is going to suffer tremendously. It's going to be a really big event. And um, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So that's it. I'm going to turn it back to Chris. And thank you very much, everybody. Super. Thanks, David. That's uh, yes, you have been beating the drum on, on some of these issues, and, and truly appreciate uh, your uh, persistence. Uh, we do to keep, need to keep moving the science forward. Uh, great job. So next, I'd look, like to look at uh, panel three, which was chaired by Dr. Uh, Joan Maliski of. Texas A&M and looking at resilience of, resilience of the uh, maritime supply chain. So, doctor. Thank you, Forrest. Um, one of, we had several things come up. Obviously, how do you um, define resilience and um, what elements of resilience uh, should we focus on? The main thing we came out of the th the um, panel was that, and we are planning to write a paper on this, that resilience has to be looked at from several different lenses. Um, an interdisciplinary approach may be more like a wicked problem where things can be fixed in one area and then uh, uh, it affects all other areas. So we, we talked about, obviously, the digital aspect of the supply chain and, and how blockchain may help in creating resilience. We talked about uh, the governance of certain areas of the port, for example, that can help us be more resilient. Uh, we you, someone else mentioned engaging stakeholders. We looked at, can we get help from local, um, state, and national government to make our infrastructure um, more resilient that leads to a better supply chain. But one of the main issues that um, no one had any kind of thought about, because it was very, you know, you, you take your breath away, and, it, and that's the idea of that uh, the captain in the last um, segment made a comment about, and that is, uh, how do we, what happens if an EMP comes and wipes us out? Where is the redundancy? To make things resilient, sometimes you have to have redundancies. And in, fair, and in maritime, we are so focused on being more efficient and cutting the costs and because we don't want the transportation cost to cost to be too much um, because it, it, it messes up the supply chain that we have no redundancies. So that kind of discussion we would like to start to see is if we had a major event, uh, where is the backup? So if we could not rely on our electronics what would that mean how would we you know move the ship home how would we uh get the cargo out of the uh, out of the port how would we uh have people be able to uh basically live get food go to the store for things like gasoline uh because there is no redundancies in some of these systems. So that is this kind of scary point, and that's where I think more discussion has to be, uh, th that redundancies, although expensive, may be needed to make sure that resilience is uh, in place. So that's kind of our group. Not, not much, but that's our group. <laughs> So next we'll, we'll look at panel five and Dr. Craig Phillips' uh, conversation on inland waterways and Great Lakes uh, resiliency. Uh, doctor. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, a personal thank you for the to the organizing committee for including a slot for the conversation we were able to have about the inland segment of the maritime domain. I've spent most of my career deeply engaged in this place, and uh, so I feel both like a protector and an advocate, and uh, was delighted to be part of our part of the sessions this week. 
Um, we had a set of uh, well, what I thought were well-balanced presentations, had a chance to look at resilience in this sector from three very different perspectives. And as I noted in my introduction, with three different disciplines uh, as, our, as our lenses, uh, we had an environmental scientist, a civil engineer, and an economist as our, as our three panelists. And I think it reflects the need for all of these perspectives if we're going uh, to deal with these, uh, these nettlesome issues like resilience. In terms of takeaways from our session, I would highlight two. And the first is uh, really something I would offer as a takeaway for the symposium as a whole. And that is that there is a really complicated interplay between the public and private stakeholders that impact maritime system resilience in multiple ways. Um, in the case of the inland sector, the uh, just as one example, the Corps of Engineers really plays an outsized role. They own, they invest in, they operate the whole network uh, of 10,000 or more navigable miles. Uh, they have a big footprint on the Great Lakes as well, of course. And this has many positive features uh, from a resilience perspective. Great economies of scale. Uh, the federal role preempts many others. Um, their role is unambiguous. Um, but the challenge of this is that it can impede the role of other stakeholders especially at the local level. And uh, one of our presentations was specifically focused on the, uh, on the Illinois River. And um, just to take that as an example, the operators on the Illinois River who run the towboats and barges, they pay for the core provided infrastructure through a system of user taxes. Uh, but honestly, their influence um, about what happens, what's invested in, what's expensed is at best indirect. Then there are other stakeholders in this particular case on the Illinois River who have had a desire and a wherewithal to invest in the in resilience enhancing aspects to the infrastructure. But local actions like this are really frustrated by the uh, by the by the by the manner in which the core is involved. So what that the takeaway for me is that there we need to think about different modes that are going to allow um, for the various stakeholders uh, to channel uh, their efforts and work to, uh, to, to affect resilience enhancing options. A second takeaway from, from the inland panel was that the maritime freight domain is, is, in, is always multimodal. Uh, they, there can be multiple maritime modes that are intersecting, but there are almost always surf, other surface transportation modes as well. And these actors don't always play nice with each other, uh, given the competitive dynamics that often exist in each of their marketplaces. But the resilience enhancements that we all know are needed are only going to happen if we can take a true multimodal perspective. And I saw this, uh, I saw this, this uh, coming out in several of the other panels over this week. Now, in terms of, so those are my two the takeaways uh, from my panel. Um, uh, an additional takeaway take away from the symposium as a whole, um, uh, Todd had something in the abstract that he had written up uh, in the in the in the program uh, that that really struck me when I was reading through it some weeks ago. Uh, lightning makes no sound until it strikes, and I think that it captures the essence of what we're drawn to. We're drawn to the abrupt, dramatic events that are going to draw our attention. Uh, and a resilience focus. And the cyber issues that got discussed uh, in one panel um, is, is a, a classic example of that. And some of the, some of the specific items that, uh, that were referenced um, a little bit ago um, are other examples. In our case, in my uh, panel, uh, extreme weather uh, comes to mind as something which we often focus on in terms of creating these dramatic um, resilient impacting events. Uh, but the, the, the maritime domain also faces leaky faucet risks um, that can reach a tipping point often under the radar. And uh, my, what I heard was that these can be ex equally disruptive and maybe with more pernicious consequences. Uh, in the case of the, the inland infrastructure, I'd point to the decay that, that's, that, that afflicts much of it. And I think some of the human workforce issues may also fall into this category. Uh, finally, as a research question, um, 
and this relates back to my, my first uh, observation, I'd like to look at the structural barriers that exist between public and private stakeholders that can limit adoption of effective resilience enhancement efforts and what we can do to overcome those barriers. And Chris, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. No, excellent, thank you, and appreciate that, uh, that thought on the uh, research question. Uh, and to keep moving along, uh, we'll move to uh, panel six and lessons learned from recent disasters. And uh, Dr. Uh, Willis, uh, Henry with us? Yes, I am, yes, thank I you, am. Chris. And also thank you to all the um, other speakers and to our hosts for a great event. Um, in terms of some takeaways I received from uh, the panel that I chaired, I'll, I'll first say that as I'm listening to the other chairs, there, there certainly are some common themes popping up across of our across each of our uh, panels, and it'll be interesting to try to tab which those are, because maybe those are even some of the most promising research areas. Uh, Aaron Davenport, uh, in his talk, demonstrated the importance of information and the need for information for both for awareness during disaster events and during the recovery. Captain Smith, uh, in telling and sharing his experiences uh, at the Port of Houston, I heard about the importance of partnerships and communication for resilience during disasters. Uh, and finally, Jennifer Carpenter, uh, I was thrilled. She may be one of those positive talks I've heard about COVID in a while. She was able to find uh, and highlight all the successes we've actually had in the maritime sector in stepping up and in, in delivering service. And uh, with that, I saw the opportunities to learn from them. So those are the takeaways I had from, from the session that I chaired. Uh, in terms of more broadly, um, the uh, there was similar themes throughout. Uh, I was particularly struck by Mike Miller's talk where he um, demonstrated both the importance and challenge of sharing lessons and experiences across sectors. And I think that the TRB brief he gave demonstrated that it, to me, highlights the value of this conference, a unique role the Coast Guard plays in working in the uh, maritime sector uh, across, across private sector government and, and with state and locals. And also highlights maybe how we could work with CISA uh, as a partner. And, and some of CISA's work was even highlighted by Jennifer Carpenter in uh, in her session where she talks about, where in her talk where she, she mentioned the uh, value that CISA's designation of, of critical workforce uh, in, in employees was useful for the industry as they attempted to bounce back from COVID. Uh, uh, a second takeaway, um, I was uh, struck by Catherine Chambers from the Army Corps, her talk, as well as from Aaron on, on the panel I had, is the dichotomy between the large number of tools and amount of information that is out there and how that can be sometimes at a mismatch with the uneven capacity of uh, localities, smaller firms or regions to have the financial resources and the human resources to implement resilience planning, and thus the role the federal government can play uh, in support of that. And then finally, uh, uh, a third takeaway from across the symposium is the importance of workforce as a linchpin to infrastructure resilience. Uh, and this came up uh, in several of the, of the talks that I, I heard aspects of as well, both the the resilience of the workforce in helping to help resilience of infrastructure and the need for infrastructure to be resilient in order to help the workforce be there. Uh, in terms of research topics that I could see going forward, um, in highlighting three of them, I'd, I'd point to one is the need to develop engineering design guidelines and operational planning templates for maritime resilience. And this can help build on the on the fact that sometimes smaller regions, smaller firms need this type of technical assistance to, to be able to, to plan. 
Uh, a second is that um, to see whether there's ways to collect lessons from COVID-19 in our experiences to understand what distinctions we see from these more prolonged events and from versus from abrupt disasters. And finally, in the context of information sharing tools, topics, and processes, I, I probably have been hanging out with one of our colleagues who wasn't able to be as involved this year, uh, Admiral Rob Parker, to say I think there are uh, the need to collect more experience and lesson learns of promising practice for what are those tools that we need to uh, spread further, uh, what types of information we be sharing, and, and how can we do it more effectively. And those would be the three uh, topics that I would highlight as potential research areas. And, and thank you for allowing the opportunity to participate in this and I look forward to, to next year's event. Super, thanks, Henry, appreciate that. Uh, it, it was nice to see uh, uh, someone find a, a silver lining out of uh, all that's been going on with COVID. I'm, I'm sure there's more, but it was nice to, to hear a positive coming from that. Uh, We'll move on to panel seven, energy resilience in the maritime sector, and uh, Dr. Lewis with the Volpe Center. All right. Um, so thank you so much, um, Chris, and thank you so much to the MRS chairs for a great week of um, panels and presentations and a great opportunity to be involved. Um, and I will also want to uh, thank the panelists for the energy resilience session. We were really fortunate to have um, Andrew Stevens from the Sustainable Shipping Initiative, Anu Chopra from Right Ship, Dan Gent from the United European Car Carriers, and our own Kate Higgins-Bloom from the U.S. Coast Guard's Evergreen Program. And uh, each of the speakers provided insights into their own and their organization's vision for the future of energy resilience in shipping, some of the challenges they faced in addressing risks related to energy resilience and innovative approaches to moving the maritime sector forward. Um, and one of the great things I think about this panel is that although each of our panelists came from different perspectives, you know, whether they were an NGO or a shipping company, um, but as the discussion proceeded, we did find that there was a lot of commonality in terms of the vision uh, moving forward and, and a few key themes that came out of the, the discussion. Um, one of the key takeaways from the discussion of future fuels and emissions reduction technologies is just that there's no single silver bullet that will fix energy resilience and shipping. Um, each of the options that are out there have trade-offs and challenges. Um, some of those challenges are related to supply availability, um, sustainability attributes, price, or safety. Um, and so the panelists really emphasize the need for a full life cycle approach to assessing costs and benefits of various energy sources and their risks. Um, but in spite of those challenges, the panel really also emphasized that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good, that we need incremental improvements now rather than waiting for perfect solutions. Um, and uh, Dan talked about how flexibility can really help a company respond to changes in supply and price. Um, and he talked about UECC's focus on flexible fuel vessels that can use a variety of fuel sources. Um, Anuj talked, for example, about um, providing incentives to to have shippers um, select more efficient vessels. Um, there were a lot of um, interesting solutions that um, provide a bridge to uh, those perfect solutions should they ever arise um, or give us those incremental um, advances that we can improve upon over time. Um, the group also discussed the fact that many of the plans that companies made for energy diversification and resilience were developed and initiated prior to the coronavirus pandemic and its associated um, impacts, economic, operational, um, and the disruptions that it's caused. Um, but one of the things we heard from the panel that was really um, exciting and reassuring is that what they're finding is the current situation is actually spurring greater interest in innovation, um, including energy diversification, as the sector sees the impacts can occur when, you know, you're really dependent on one particular system. Um, the panelists also made the case that in the past, the maritime sector has mostly been reactive to compliance requirements for things like um, carbon emissions, things that are handed down by the IMO or regulated by states. But what they're finding is that the sector is now more focused on being proactive on sustainability and resilience and emphasize that customers of shipping are not looking for minimum compliance anymore. They're looking for best practices. They're looking uh, to lead. 
um, and that there's also some challenges related to localism and regulations that can make it difficult for ship owners who might have a ship that can operate in one port but not in others because of a patchwork of regulations. So there was um, interest in having a, a more harmonized um, a, approach to um, sustainability um, and energy resilience. Um, in the panel's closing remarks, uh, they all, all, the, all our panelists emphasize the need for collaborative leadership on these issues and trying to find global solutions that cross industries and boundaries. Um, so it was really a, a very positive, forward-looking um, discussion with, uh, with great ideas and, and uh, some real commonalities that hopefully the industry can build on. So I just uh, want to thank again the panelists for their willingness to share their insights. Um, regarding takeaways from MRS as a whole, I also, as um, Captain Bonner did, would return to what Steve Flynn talked about at the beginning of the week um, and what we have seen as we've talked about all these different aspects of resiliency all week, that we are now more interconnected than ever and we're dependent on these systems of systems. And that interdependency means we need collaboration not just within and across the maritime sector, but it's potentially collaboration across other sectors as well so that we create those resilient systems systems of systems, and energy is certainly one of those crucial systems on which everything else relies to function. Um, to bring it to next research steps, um, the panel, uh, again, emphasizes a critical issue, continuing to evaluate life cycle benefits and impacts of alternative fueling options for the maritime sector um, to help provide understanding of not just carbon emissions reduction, um, but a broader range of sustainability issues so that we can identify trade-offs and synergies that can influence the direction of fueling choices and fuel diversification. Um, and while collaboration was really a strong focus of the, of the panel and was mentioned several different times um, in several different contexts, um, one area of research that resonates with both the collaboration theme of the session and this idea of having um, harmonized approaches is the fact that um, shipping may have different opportunities from other sectors, such as, say, aviation, but many of the novel fuel production pathways that are out there that are options potentially for, for the maritime sector produce multiple products, and they range from jet fuel to diesel, um, potentially gasoline, um, light ends like naphtha. So there may actually be synergistic approaches that we could take to facilitating deployment of new fuels that would increase the diversification of fuel supplies for the maritime sector, but also other sectors at the same time. Um, and one thing I wanted to draw um, the group's attention to is that, in addition, the aviation sector has similar industry carbon emissions goals and requirements from ICAO as the maritime sector does from IMO. And the global carbon cap on international aviation, called the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, or CORSIA, it's actually starting in two months. It's starting at the beginning of, of 2021, um, and that carbon cap will require airlines to offset their emissions growth um, every year. Um, so there are lessons the maritime sector can learn from the implementation of Corsia under ICAO that could maybe be brought forward as lessons um, for IMO. Um, and there's also the potential to benefit from or synergize with the uh, deployment initiative or incentive that is offered by Corsia, and that might facilitate the availability of alternative mar maritime fuels as well. Um, so, you know, one idea would be to seek um, collaborative opportunities between the aviation and maritime sectors to facilitate supply chain development and deployment of carbon beneficial fuels so that both could benefit from accelerated progress. Um, so those are some of the themes and takeaways from our group. It was a, a wide-ranging discussion. There was way more uh, interesting stuff to talk about than I could possibly have brought up um, in this short recap. Um, and so thanks again to, to everyone for making it possible. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay. Um, while we're uh, waiting for people to get their uh, thoughts together and, and uh, bring some questions forward, uh, one question I have for the panel, um, a little bit of a discussion already to it, but uh, it, it was mentioned, you know, that you know, while our oceans are a global commons, our maritime system is, is certainly a global connector uh, for which uh, aspects of maritime resilience should we pr seek to focus on in developing international standards? Where do we need that? uniformly, most importantly. Any uh, any thoughts from the panel? 
Dr. Lewis, you certainly mentioned uh, uh, fuel as, as one. Uh, uh, any other thoughts? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I completely understood the question. Could you, could you? Um, I'm sorry, certainly. Uh, you know, we mentioned uh, standardizations in terms of emissions and and, uh, uh, and so forth as, as one that were for international, uh, shared international uh, regulation as opposed to uh, independent, independent state driven. Uh, what other key areas of um, uh, do we need to look at in terms of uh, standards that are being developed uh, for uh, resilience? Um, I, I think that's a, a great question. And, you know, we talk a lot um, about emissions requirements that have um, been put forward, um, but there are a lot of potential areas that, at least from the energy perspective, that um, that can really potentially be impacted or benefited from different choices. Um, I know, uh, for example, I, I mentioned at the end of my recap about the idea of bringing over some, um, you know, of the experience from the ICAO and aviation sector to IMO, um, and uh, certainly the um, Corsia structure includes not only carbon requirements, uh, or, or it has several different types of requirements to address sustainability um, that are intersecting with this straight up uh, emissions requirements. And I think one thing we heard from our panel is just that having um, fuel requirements or individual um, energy um, restrictions, uh, for example, um, uh, the, ca the uh, restriction on fossil fuels import that California has put forward, um, you know, make it really difficult to function. And so um, I think having more coordination and thinking about how um, sustainability and um, the uh, efforts to make um, to provide uh, direction on choices about fueling, if there were more and more harmonization, it, it seems like that would be much easier to manage. I hope that answered a little bit of your question. No, it, it does. Thank you. Uh, any uh, other thoughts from other uh, members of the uh, panel? Okay. Um, sounds like Chris, up. Yes. Chris, if you want another response to that, uh, John Please. Jorgensen. Uh, is is very key on uh, getting international standards out for cybersecurity. I think he's on there right now. I also think uh, Cameron Naron's on there. He's also involved in a lot of the uh, international uh, connectivity of all this. But uh, I think cyber, and again, I think uh, you know the the connectivity of all these vessels with the land-based operations need to get it needs to get internationally controlled. And, and uh, the redundancy aspects that were talked about earlier are not there for those systems. If they're on the coast, not a problem. They, they can go to alternate systems. But once they're out on the big ocean, it's all those satellites, and they're very, uh, they're very uh, vulnerable, a, a number of different effects. And, and they, they can be even natural effects like that uh, solar activity. So just wanted to put that out there again. All right. Super. Thanks, David. Uh, it seems, sounds like we have a hot mic out there. If uh, people could check their settings, uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, another question uh, that I have for the panel, uh, a recurring theme that I heard uh, throughout the uh, symposium was how expensive building uh, resilience can be. And so just looking for thoughts on, on how do we make the business case uh, to, to drive investment and, and the understanding for the for the need for uh, building resiliency. Uh, tying into that, there was a comment, I think that was in uh, uh, Todd Bonner's uh, uh, abstract, that so society is very dependent on our maritime uh, industry, but I'm not sure society understands how dependent they are, so not necessarily appreciating uh, the uh, the need for investment. So thoughts on, on how do we make the, uh, the business case uh, moving forward? Todd, can we uh, start with you? Yeah, I was yeah. just uh, jumping on there, Chris. I think it's a great question. Um, I think I was thinking about this a little bit today. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, having the academics here probably is a good starting point. Uh, I don't know how many MBAs, graduates I talk to that are proponents of just-in-time uh, and, and the whole, you know, reducing all your overhead to minimum costs and maximizing the profits. That That is a great business model. However, 
when a shock hits, it doesn't work very well. And I think uh, the fact that our society society was reduced to uh, hoarding toilet paper only about seven months ago probably speaks volumes to that. Um, I think I think part of it is really is uh, is public messaging too from the government to assure people that things are going to flow, that supplies are going to be there. Um, there's probably a public messaging um, component too about the necessity to support a strong maritime industry. A um, little bit out of my lane, military, we have something that we call um, sea blindness where certainly up in Canada, they, a lot of people don't realize that we're a nation with three coasts uh, and we're quite reliant on trade coming in through the maritime uh, highways to keep our economy rolling. So a lot of it is about messaging. A lot of it is about getting the word out. Um, and I think uh, I would probably look at the academics on how you how you change the business models. Uh, this is John Molaski. I, I want to make a comment about that. One of the things we're struggling with is to quantify the risk. So if you want to buy insurance for something, you have to know, you have to quantify the risk. If, if companies were required under their accounting standards to quantify some of these risks, pandemic potentials, cyber attacks, et cetera, um, they, they may start to pay, you know, pay attention to this a little bit more. If you find out if you were attacked, it's going to be $400 million of your net worth. You might say, well, maybe I should pay attention to this. So we're, we're struggling with trying to say, how do you quantify this? And then it, once you see the big numbers, there's uh, attention paid by the companies. Let me, uh, no, let me just, Craig, this, this is Craig, Craig, Craig Phillip. Craig Phillip. Let me add to that. Um, I think Joan raises a stakeholder that I know I haven't heard mentioned in the uh, over the course of the week, and that's the uh, the role of the insurance uh, companies and providers. And um, uh, certainly, from the perspective of the private sector stakeholders, they would seem to be in a position to play a role uh, as as valuing the uh, the. Uh, the risk and uh, and motivating companies to address it. Um, as far as the public sector is concerned, maybe it's one of the um, unintended benefits that will come out of COVID. Um, everybody is now aware of the presence or lack thereof of, of strategic stockpiles of things. And uh, it may be easier to, to uh, help the populace and the taxpayers to understand the, the um, the physical strategic stockpile of stuff in a warehouse, um, but we may need we may need to become more nimble at at describing the uh, kind of the elements of resilience that are important to our um, our sector and uh, what they look like and and uh, how important they are and in the scheme of things how little they cost. So that's um, thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I like that thought um, because it, it keeps striking to me that most of our populations don't understand how much of what they use every day comes by ship, and they don't understand how dependent they are on the maritime transportation system to be up and functioning. So even when we talk about insurance, I mean, typically we're looking at first order effects to, you know, to the direct shipping companies or or uh, uh, structures, you know, instantly, you know, you know, right on the shoreline and not thinking about the second and third order impacts. And and then that would lead, that understanding perhaps would lead to a better understanding by our political leadership in terms of the importance of the maritime. I'm not sure the maritime is uh, appreciated uh, in any real degree in, in any nation, or at least particularly in this nation, in how critical it is to our, our uh, economy and, and daily survival. Uh, Henry, it looks like you want to jump in. I say it reminds me of um, work that I was doing. I think it was 2006, 2007. It was before the crash of 2008, and at that time, there was a lot of talk about brittle supply chains and how the you know the Asian shipping was booming and our ports couldn't take the growth, and uh, we really needed a, a consolidated national freight strategy. And 
I found that one of the challenges to getting the public recognizing the importance is that even I couldn't necessarily even get the the shippers or the carriers agreeing on what the importance is. Some of them, some one of the perspectives was, um, well, if I, if rail gets too expensive, I'll just go to truck, and if shipping gets too effective, expensive on the West Coast, I'll go to the East Coast and maybe I'll use uh, airlines for some of the stuff. Uh, you know, I think in a worse case, it says if it starts being, we've seen this, it becomes too expensive to ship things in and the people start sourcing in Mexico or U.S. or, or other places. So it, it does seem like some of the goals we want out of the shipping sec sector are things that, in that, in some cases, we have to decide as a, a nation society that that's what we want. Some of the safety, volume, uh, environmental efficiency you can get out of it, uh, and have a, a, a national freight plan. In our in our session, Jennifer Carpenter pointed out the the magnitude of the infrastructure needs that we need now just to maintain resilience. And it sounded like her perception was we're not even getting that at the moment. So it may be a case where uh, there more analysis and more communication from people like we're here expressing the value that it brings, the choices we have, but what the, what the national or coordinated strategy would need to be to make it happen. Great, thanks. Uh, any other comments? Okay, uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, this came in from uh, Admiral uh, Fred Rosa. It says, uh, apologies if I missed any discussion on this point. Did any of the various panelists highlight particularly compelling maritime examples of a commercial entity investing in resilience, i.e. maintaining operations through and or recovering quickly from disasters and concurrently realizing collateral dividends in terms of profit margins market share, reduced insurance premiums, uh, reputation, et cetera. Uh, any known uh, examples of that uh, from uh, disasters, hurricane, natural disasters, others? Anyone on the panel? Um, this is Kristen Lewis. So we did have um, on the energy resilience panel, um, Dan Gent from UECC talked about the efforts that um, they've been making to invest in new vessels, vessels that are flexible, that can take different types of fuels. Um, and one of the things that um, he talked about was uh, recent challenges they've had uh, over the years with um, plunging oil prices and changes in market um, for cars and other things that have caused it to be challenging for them to deliver um, vehicles and uh, that the diversification of their energy supply uh, within a, a, an individual vessel um, was seen as, as a way to mitigate that. Um, it's a little bit different in terms of uh, the specifics, the specific requests you had about market share and insurance premiums, but I think it represents a, a commercial entity investing in resilience um, very explicitly to help their bottom line and their business proposition. I might also add, Fred, um, uh, you may already be aware of it, but I UFC Sheffy and Jim Rice over at MIT had written uh, the book, The Resilient Enterprise, and provided some great examples about how by, uh, it wasn't sort of marginal or incremental economic benefits that firms who accounted for resilience got, but uh, existential benefits that firms, uh, you have several cases where firms who didn't take into account resilience aren't around anymore because someone who did captured all the market share. And there was, a, I think his canonical example was Ericsson phones uh, in, a, in a supply chain disruption. But the uh, the two other dimensions of the many things you're talking about, the, uh, the, I think we've seen some interesting things going on in the Gulf South, looking at broader societal resilience and how uh, Louisiana and Mississippi and others, whether it's Deepwater Horizon or Katrina, have tried to uh, improve the planning, reduce the level of vulnerability of some of their communities, and in some cases exceeded, some cases failed. 
the one part that I haven't seen a lot on is successful uh, monetization, sort of financialization of, of some of these resilience um, aspects. I've seen people try to create resilience bonds or, or, or create financial products that could get long-term, particularly climate change resilience in, but I haven't seen it. I've seen experimental stuff, but nothing widely uptaken. I, I will jump in there. This is Joan Maleski again. It is enormously expensive. <laughs> we are trying to get what we call the Ike Dike, which is critical infrastructure protection. Uh, most of the companies in the port have raised their. Um, uh, we have an Ike. We have a dike around the refineries and such like that. But not everything is protected, which means if you have to run the maritime stuff or the supply chain and you're, everybody's wiped out personally, it makes it very hard to get your people to work um, in, the, in the port and, and on ships and such. But that estimated cost of that Ike Dike, which would pr protect the people as well as the infrastructure, is uh, you know somewhere between three and ten billion dollars, and we don't see anybody with a big checkbook coming down here to do that, and that's just Houston. So now we go from Houston, and you got New Orleans, and you've got. Mississippi and Alabama and parts of Florida. So so that's part of the issue is that um, uh, we don't have the money to do some of these things. Thanks, Dr. Um, also First, for, uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, to answer Admiral Rosa there. Uh, I, I worked pretty closely with uh, Jim Scally, and I, I think if you recall his slides, uh, that they hit this plateau, they were having an incident every seven days and uh, they reached 22 or 24 days for a while. It wasn't until they added a resilience foundation to their entire program of hundreds of ships, hundreds of ships, that they, they managed to go to 43 days uh, between incidents. And uh, that was worth a lot of money to them. It's probably worth uh, tens of millions, maybe more to them. So uh, Fred can put that on this list. All right, thanks, Dad. Uh, Dr. Right. Phil, with the inland waterways and the recurring flooding, uh, any um, any lessons there or any examples there uh, where developing and investing in resiliency has, has provided a, a competitive advantage? The, um, the, mo the most significant uh, uh, example has been a, an evolving institutional framework, and if uh, um, my colleague Jennifer Carpenter from the American Waterway Operators is still on. She may want to add to this as well. But the the uh, the industry and especially the Coast Guard, but also the Corps of Engineers, has developed a very robust uh, program, which is uh, kind of operates under the rubric of waterway action plans, and uh, it has had a dramatic allowed a dramatic improvement of the continuing operation of the system uh, in the face of of disruptive extreme weather type events, high water, low water, flooding, and so forth, um, by proactively taking steps that, that come out of lessons learned from previous events and have codified the steps that the uh, the, the respective stakeholders will take to, to protect the operational integrity of the system, oftentimes by reducing the capacity of the system, but allowing it to at least operate at a reduced level. and. Um, I, I'm, I can't point directly. Um, I mean, I think the individual operators would uh, perhaps uh, point to the to the economic impact of that. It's absolutely been positive in terms of extending the number of operational days that uh, that are now that are now uh, a, a standard operating procedure in the face of of, situ of environmental situations that simply shut the system down. Uh, in past years. So that's the best example I can think of, although I have not seen a, a monetization of what that's meant. Super, thank you. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, being Friday afternoon and not wanting to be between people in their weekends, uh, what I'd like to do is just offer an opportunity for each of uh, our panelists to provide any final thoughts. Uh, and then uh, we'll move to uh, close out this panel. So starting again at the uh, top and, uh, you know, Todd, any uh, any final thoughts? 
No, I just want to thank all the uh, the organizers for a really interesting um, subject to to look at and go do a deep dive into. And I thought it was really good. And uh, congratulations to all for a really good uh, conference. Super. Thank you, uh, David. Any any final thoughts? Same thing. I, I, I have to say, year after year, we have all these poor people step up and, and drop everything in their lives to get this done, like David and, and Andrea did this year. So, And Fred Roberts did it at Rutgers many years ago, and there's so many more people. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for continuing uh, with this. I think it's extremely important, and this was uh, excellent, excellent uh, recovery by um, Siri to get this done. They did a great job. Thank you. Thanks, David. And uh, Joan, uh, your final thoughts? I, I just think we've gotten some great ideas from the academics have from for potential research projects to really focus in on this terrible, well, we call it a wicked problem of, of uh, risk assessment and, and resilience. And um, so we are grateful for being included so we could hear everyone's ideas and we appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, uh, Craig, final thoughts? Uh, well, thank you, Chris. And th this is the second one of these I've had the privilege of uh, participating in. And and the uh, my my final takeaway it would be uh, um, I've, I came away from the last one and from from this week uh, realizing that uh, that uh, resilience isn't a spectator sport. You have to be in it and uh, in the game. Thanks. Oh, absolutely. And by the way, I do appreciate the fact that we've been able to incorporate uh, the Inland River and, and Great Lakes perspective into these uh, conferences. So it was a, an area that we were definitely a gap that we had in the earlier uh, symposium. So very much uh, appreciate having the uh, the additional perspective uh, in these uh, symposiums uh, as we move forward. Uh, Henry, final thoughts? Thank you to our host, uh, the Resilience Center, showing us how to be resilient and, and pull off a great session. In conference. Super, thanks. And Kristen? Yeah, I just want to echo the thanks that everyone has already said. It was a, a great week and a, a great opportunity. And I think one of the things that was really exciting about it was just that um, this is a time when it's really difficult to be. Um, you know, uh, to not dwell on the challenges that we're facing. And I think one of the things that was really encouraging is just how much um, looking forward and positivity and forward momentum there is um, within the group uh, and, and all the talks uh, this week. So that was really exciting to see. And, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here. And thanks to the audience as well. Super. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the time in the panel. And again, I, I truly appreciate uh, you know, each of you stepping forward and agreeing to, to chair a panel. I've chaired several in the past. I know uh, that it, it's uh, a bit of work putting together the panel, sometimes doing some pleading and arm bending to get the right people on your panels that you want. But uh, uh, as in past years this year, I, I thought the panels were fantastic. Uh, I enjoyed uh, all of the information, the different perspectives that, that came forward and that gave us the uh, you know diverse uh, you know, community of thought and the richness of, of thinking that that uh, we need as we take on the, uh, as Joan said, these uh, wicked problems. So uh, very much appreciate your, your time and your energy. I truly appreciate our, our host's uh, efforts uh, and uh, remarkably few uh, technical glitches uh, through all this. And when there were, like with myself, I think it was more user error than anything on, that you could control on your end. So thank you very much uh, for hosting this uh, this year and, and all your your hard work behind the scenes. I, I know it took a lot. Uh, with that, I will turn over to uh, David Nickel for, uh, as our symposium chair. Okay, wonderful. In my uh, opening remarks, um, I told a story how uh, a little over two years ago, uh, Joe Dorenzo uh, came to me and strongly encouraged in ways that only he can, that uh, Siri step up and uh, host this event uh, this year. That was a long time ago. Um, this is my fourth uh, MRS, uh, and I have uh, learned a lot every time. But what I told Joe when he encouraged us to take this on, I said, you know, Joe, I know that we can put on a conference. We do that all the time because I've got a great team and... You saw the efforts and the, the outcome of this great team. 
And um, I can take credit for hiring a great team. That's that's about it. <laughs> they've, they've done a really fabulous job. But I said, Joe, you know, you're in the maritime space, and that's not like my main gig. Um, I got to have help. You know, I can I can run the thing. But, you know, you're a co-chair. Dude, you've got to you've got to help with, you know, finding the right people. And so there's lots and lots of thanks that are going around and we appreciate them. Um, and with respect to uh, the support team, they're absolutely well deserved. Uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that everybody knows uh, the behind the scenes role that Joe played in this in uh, getting the right people onto the organizing committee. And then uh, my thanks to the organizing committee for stepping up and giving their time and identifying uh, the, the panel topics and the panel chairs and the panelists. And these are people who are in this space. And, you know, they, they created uh, what is evidently, and to me anyway, and to experts in marine uh, uh, systems, you know, a really, a really interesting program and a great way to spend this particular week. So, um, again, thanks to, to Joe. Thanks to the uh, organizing committee uh, to pull this together. Thanks for the the amazing support team that that pulled this all together. I think we learned some things, um, you know. But one of the things we learned, and um, Henry, you made you made a remark that sort of reflected something that I had in in my mind. Is well, we learned how to be resilient with this program, not just by going virtual when it became impossible to uh, meet in person, but things like you know the recordings that we did um, were largely done because we were concerned about you know things that might happen uh, to the network, uh, to the people that, you know, we wanted to be reaching out and have, having them pulled in, but there's a benefit, you know, so we have all these recordings now and these recordings, uh, can be referenced by others. And I would just leave it to be thought by, you know, future MRS folks to think about, um, possibly investing in, in the recordings to have this leave behind, um, to, to leave a, a more uh, permanent record. I, it, was, it would just go to show something that I think we all know and suspect that um, life after the uh, virus uh, subsides is going to be different. The way we work is going to be different. The way that we conference is going to be different. And so, you know, I, I think that some of the things that we learned in running this uh, conference might, might apply there. One of the really beneficial side effects of the way that we did this was the very much larger uh, participation by students in the in the student poster event and that's something else i would ask the, the future uh, conference chairs to think about um, because not involving travel means that there can be more participation i thought we had just an outstanding slate of uh, keynote speakers and previous mrs have had outstanding slates of keynote speakers but it's a lot easier to pull somebody in um, if they find out that they can do this uh, remotely rather than spend a day traveling to the event, spending the morning at the event, spending the rest of the day traveling uh, back to wherever they come from. Uh, so we, we might be able to have access to, to more really top, top people uh, to pull into the conference. Uh, so... Um, that's that, those are my thoughts. Um, I am personally very <laughs> relieved. Uh, this is almost over. It's not completely over because we've, you know, got some uh, videos to get out to, to YouTube. We've got some transcriptions to do, um, but we're just uh, delighted at the uh, participation. Um, that has been evidenced and um, happy to declare that I think that this was a successful event uh, in no small part because of the behind the scenes people that made it happen and in great part because of the insights and uh, interactions that all of you brought to this. So with that, I guess I say uh, meeting adjourned. And so thanks again.